Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. I have two experts in the world in animal cognition, in particular in dog behavior. And I don't know. <laughs> everyone thinks they're an expert in dog behavior. Like, everyone thinks they're an expert in parenting. <laughs> Is that true? It's true, yes. <laughs> now, you have a dog, Brian. I do, I do. What kind there, of, we need to establish this right from the get-go, like if you're a reliable source. It is. I, I've had many dogs in my life, but we currently have a dog named Congo, and he mm -hmm. is a retired service dog from Canine Companions, mm -hmm. and he is uh, acting principal of the Duke Puppy Kindergarten, where we raise <laughs> service dog puppies, so he kind of teaches them the ropes. Now, Canine Companions, they're here. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Since So since they originally? are the largest service dog provider in the country, uh, and they do have a campus uh, here in New York. Uh, and so we have Nira and her handler, Alex, are here tonight. Mm -hmm. And Nira is very close to finishing her training. And if she certifies, she'll be placed with somebody who has either mental or physical disabilities that she can help and form a team and a partnership and help them uh, do things that they couldn't do otherwise. So it's, it's a great organization to work with. You should stop at the desk on the other side of this wall here and um, check out the Canine Companions information. Very interesting. And let's not traumatize her right as she's about to go into her full <laughs> occupation. Alexander, do you have a dog? Oh, it's like a professional responsibility <laughs> to, have, to live with a dog. And right now I, we, we live with just one dog, Quiddity, who is a little... Uh, mixed breed monster um, and we used to, we just lost two of our other dogs last year but yeah I think I mean in fact living with dogs is part of the way we generate hypotheses about what we want to study so I, I do I sort of joke about it being a professional responsibility but I think it's an important part of our seeing dogs is to mm -hmm. not just see them in the lab but see them day to day now um, to uh, some extent, um, yeah, I just snuck that on you. <laughs> Almost all the dogs in this are somehow have some affiliation with all these dogs. Um, you talk about how you became interested in the subject via being a dog person, being a oh, dog. Yeah, I mean, I was somebody like many of you, perhaps, who's lived with dogs all their life, but I never, never thought I would study dogs. Uh, and I really fell into it accidentally because I was, it was a complete accident. And, it, and one I sort of had to be pushed into because when I was in graduate school, there weren't a lot of people studying dogs um, as cognitively interesting. I, I did cognitive science for my degree and I was interested in non-human animal minds. So we would look at primates, right? We'd look mm -hmm. at big-brained animals and people weren't really looking at dogs, um, but I wanted to study play behavior, and I was casting about for dog for animals who played a lot, so I could get a lot of videotape evidence of what they were doing in play. Meanwhile, I lived with a dog, and I was taking her out to play like twice a day for about six months before it occurred to me, because I was a narrow-minded graduate student, that I should be studying dogs. And so my dissertation was about, in fact. Um, videotaping dogs at play and analyzing what happens in there. Now it is, uh, I learned from reading your books, um, an interesting phenomenon that dogs as a scientific uh, object of study were, were not really considered a valid um, subject. What, how did that change, Brian? And, and it's quite recent, is that fair to say? First of all, there's like 80 million dogs in the country. Yes. And how is it possible that this was not considered a valid area of scientific study? So I think um, most of the questions that people were asking about animal cognition, uh, they wanted to understand um, something more about humans. And so the natural idea was if you're going to understand something about human development or about how humans evolved our cognitive abilities, then all the answers will be uh, learn from studying primates and particularly great apes which i've spent a lot of time doing myself and they have a lot to teach us um, but it ends up that sitting at every anthropologist and psychologist feet that i want to be around anyway uh those people uh they had one of the most powerful scientific tools uh imaginable to learn more about ourselves which is our dogs mm -hmm. and the sort of the revolution that happened was and the very short version of this is one of the things that we think and know is critical to becoming human uh, between the time of being nine, or the age of nine to 12 months. It's something that 
primates really struggle with, and we uh, scientists had argued and thought that it might be unique, a unique feature of our species, it ends up that dogs are quite remarkable. Hmm. Uh, and so this distant relative is able to do something very human-like, and all of a sudden, scientists are like, what? <laughs> um, and so then dogs became this very exciting thing to study. I'm sure we'll pick it apart later, but give us a little preview. What is that thing? So that thing is um, uh, all of us were born uh, very egocentric, um, and some of us escape that. And some of us uh, still of us, are. I knew you'd enjoy that. Some of us escape that more than others. Um, but we, we all, uh, um, all normally developing humans around 9 to 12 months of age, we begin to understand that others can have thoughts and beliefs that are different from our own. And one of the critical uh, first signs that you're having this new social understanding of others is you start to comprehend the gestures, the gestural communication of others, the gaze direction of others as really imp important. Uh, and, and it's important because you can learn what's going on inside someone else's head from their gesture that, oh, you see something that I don't know about. You may even be trying to help me. Uh, and so that's what we have seen mm -hmm. maybe dogs so are quite good at. We're going to come to the point where we're talking about the actual experiments you've been doing to think about that. I think what we all intuitively understand, actually maybe I should ask, how many of you have dogs? I think it would be easier to ask this, how many of you Wolf. do not, have never had a dog? Okay, well we're gonna talk to you after. Your photo has been captured. So there is this insane attachment bond with dogs. It is insane, and we all know it even if we don't have dogs. Anecdotally, we all know how people want to talk to you about their dogs, and it happened to me several times tonight, and some of you are my friends, don't feel bad, but you pulled out your phones to show me a picture of your dog. And um, it's like the bond attachment with children. And, but that's not just a cursory observation, there's something to that. Is that right, Yeah, I Alexandra? mean, and some of it builds on what Brian was saying a little bit, which is that they look at us. I mean, that is not trivial. It seems trivial, but I mean, if you think about when you are in admiration and having that moment with your dog where you, they seem to truly understand you, it's a moment that they have looked at you in the face. And other non-human animals tend to not do that. In fact, dog's closest relation Wolves, well, do, just let me just say, do not gaze into a wolf's face, right? Like that, for wolves, that is a threat behavior. It's appropriate because eyes are powerful. And somehow, dogs have over domestication. We have selected them for this and or they have also evolved into being creatures for whom the eye contact is not just um, a threat. It is also a moment of affiliation. And we very much read it that way. We read it as understanding. We read it as love, right? And so just having bootstrapped on that little behavior that we do with each other uh, and sort of starts a little bit of that bond. And then there are other there are experiments looking at how they've hijacked this oxytocin feedback loop where we get a big boost of oxytocin from gazing at our baby's face, right? Which helps us want to continue to care for this highly dependent, noisy creature. And in <laughs> They're addition, terrible things. Exactly. And we get that same kind of feedback from gazing at our dogs. And to some extent, they also get an oxytocin boost. So they've kind of hitchhiked on some of these human bonding features that work so well within our species. Mm -hmm. Now, some, what are some of the big scientific questions that you think are still outstanding that we can ask and answer about dogs? Ooh, so many. She's looking at me. I'm yeah, like, I am. I, like a dog, I was <laughs> right, right, right. making eye contact. Uh, so many. Uh, so I think, you know, my previous answer was all about this remarkable thing that dogs share with humans. And um, so one of the reasons dogs became really scientists' best friend or psychologists' best friend is because they have something to teach us about ourselves. Um, but uh, one of the big questions, and we all, uh, those of you who have had dogs and multiple dogs in your life, one of the big things that's so amazing about them is they're all different. They all have individual personalities and they're so unique and then they're dogs at the same time. And so scientifically trying to capture what is it that makes those individuals so different from each other 
and then use that information in a useful way, um, whether it's trying to predict training outcomes um, or how to have dogs that are so good at doing so many different jobs, have them do those, do those jobs better or have more dogs available to do those jobs. You've also worked with dogs in the military. Yes, uh, uh, detector dogs, that's right. Yeah, so we, we uh, have worked with the, uh, the Marine Corps, uh, in particular funded by the Navy, uh, to try to use some of our new understanding of how dog psychology functions and sometimes how it doesn't function. Because um, I'm not here to say that dogs are always genius. In fact, they're not, um, partic particularly. Don't ask them to do your physics homework. Uh, I, would, I would definitely come to Jana, not your dog. Uh, and um, I have a picture of that later. You'll all recognize it when it um, comes up. But, but, but the, the challenge was um, anytime you have a program like Canon Companions program or you have detector dogs, uh, dogs can do remarkable things. But not all dogs can. And then the question becomes identifying the dog that is best at the job you need them to do. How do you identify that dog? Um, and if you're in detector work where you're going through, uh, you know, trying to deal with improvised explosive devices, you really want to know the dog you're with knows what they're doing. Um, and so how do you make sure of that? Yeah, Alexandra. Well, I mean, I would hitchhike on what he's saying about the, the power of studying individuals. I mean, as this field is pretty new, this field of studying dog cognition, dog minds, we were just been focused on what do dogs do, right? Do dogs follow points? Do dogs follow our gaze? Do they solve these tasks? But then the more we look at it, we realize, right, there's a really different performance between all these different subjects and, in fact, between all the different dogs. I mean, the reason you're here is not because you think you have just a generic dog, but you have a very special dog. And you do, right? Your dog is idiosyncratic, and that is the thing that we treasure about them. So scientifically, it's a challenge to try to capture individual differences in personality, uh, in cognition. For myself, I'm also very interested in just what it is like to be a dog. I mean, that is my kind of overarching research question. Mm -hmm. And that involves a lot of understanding of their perceptual world. Well, what that's a that's a great um, moment to bring this in because their perception of the world is so different from ours. And we take our perception so for granted. So light is hitting my eye and I have this vivid hallucination of this map of the world. It's really so taken for granted because we're very visual animals. But dogs are very different from us, both in their perception and then presumably in their consciousness. So right. what and are it some starts of the with what they're seeing or yeah. detecting in yeah. any and way. I mean, they have decent vision, right? They're mm -hmm. nearsighted. They have two-color vision instead of three-color vision. They can see motion really well. They see a wider field of vision. They see better at night. So they are seeing sort of different stimuli. But the fact that their olfactory sense is so extraordinary, which is why they are easily trained as detector dogs, essentially, mm -hmm. To me, that's kind of revolutionary. And I think they're a good model for trying to understand the perspective of others because we really don't think of this room as filled with smells. I mean, hopefully. We, we are not <laughs> give experiencing it, give it, it now. Give it 40 it's minutes filled with or smells. so. That's right. I mean, but every dog in this room is experiencing it that way. And that the dog can be so companionably alongside us living in our universe and also experiencing another sensory universe to me is really profound and interesting. And I want to know more about that, partly mm -hmm. so that they can be better detective dogs, detect, detective, I mean, they are sort of de detection <laughs> dogs or service dogs, but also so that we have better, a better relationship of them, wrought of an understanding of them rather mm -hmm. than just making attributions about who they are. So they obviously have a nose and they absorb volatile molecules like we do. We call yeah. those scents. But I've heard you discuss that they have a second nose. Well, it's a way of talking about it. With, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a, a, what I think of as a second nose above the roof of the mouth, below the nasal septum, called the vomeronasal organ. It's a horrible name for actually a very handy little organ, which is a, allows them to detect hormones. Um, and, and that's different than smelling, right? Because we're used to smelling like volatile molecules. We both molecules smell in the same way. We go mm -hmm. up through the nostrils, and then there's a little postage stamp size um, band of tissues right about here, where they're all factory receptors. Those are just cells that are going to grab the volatile organic compounds, which are just anything that we call a smell, and interpret it, and either send a signal to the brain, and we think, oh, coffee, or mm -hmm. not. 
and we exhale, by exhaling, we get rid of that smell, right? If you're in a room with a foul odor and you want to get rid of the smell, you blow out your nose. So dogs do have that mechanism as well, um, although they just have hundreds of millions more receptors up here, meaning that they're able to detect many more combinations of odors and things in, often in many lower thresholds, thankfully, than we can detect. And they also have this fabulous way of exhaling that um, people who study movement of air have discovered, which is that instead of exhaling out their nostrils like they do, like we do, they exhale out those side slits in their nose. And the reason they do that is that it enables them to get a continuous, basically olfactory percept of the world. They don't, they don't want to be blinking every time they need to get the air out of their nose and not seeing. Instead, they get this sort of circular breathing, continuous olfactory image of the world out there. So here's a picture of you know, the oxytocin hormone being emitted, the hug hormone. Um, and so you're saying that the dogs can actually detect those hormones, like directly, not just interpreting your body language or are you happy, but can actually absorb it and have a direct response in the brain. The, the vomeronasal organ detects these heavier weight molecules that actually have to be absorbed through the skin of their mouth. So if you see a dog licking another dog's they're urine, tasting it. for instance, they, they're right, but not for, for its fine qualities, but instead to pull out the hormones and, and then if the brain attaches meaning to them after they've been detected. So yes, there, you know, there have been studies that literally show that dogs are able to identify the smell of fear, for in instance, exuded by a person. Mm -hmm. Is that happening through the vomeronasal organ? Probably, but I don't know mm -hmm. that anybody has drawn that map, right? Mm -hmm. But that might be how it's happening. So Ryan, have you ever thought about whether dogs translate since their perception, olfactory perception is so elaborate that they maybe make a map of it? Is it possible that when they smell, they have the same kind of vivid hallucination of a, of a space that, that it's like seeing for them? Wow, um, I don't know. Um, uh, and I, I think Alexandra has done an amazing job at really emphasizing how uh, when we are looking at animals and thinking about other organisms on this planet that we're very constrained as humans to imagine what it might be like. Um, and so, uh, you know, one thing that's important to emphasize is, uh, you know, we've talked about cognition, we've said the word cognition several times, and so I want to make sure that we kind of define it a little bit. Um, and because a lot of people think of intelligence as cognition, and, and I would make a distinction between the two, and I think it speaks to your question, um, is often when we think of intelligence, all of us have been assigned some number on a test, uh, and you know, it's, it's some you know, uh, linear uh, hierarchy of outcomes, and if you get a high number, you probably did really well, and you feel really intelligent, and if you got a low number, you're not. Well, when you study animal cognition, that's not at all how we think about animal uh, intelligence. In fact, um, instead, we think there's different kinds of intelligences, and they vary independently from one another. Um, so you can be really good at one thing and not be so good at another. Uh, and so one of the challenges is to even describe what are the different kinds of intelligence in organisms that have types of intelligence that we don't even have because of perceptual systems, for instance. So this is bringing it back to your original question. So when people challenge you, oh, no, 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 we can definitely put intelligence on some list of, uh, you know, top to bottom. And people ask me all the time, oh, dog or cat, which one is smarter? Every journalist wants me to answer that question. What do you say? Oh, I drive them crazy because I always say, well, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. And they're like, oh, what's the question? I say, well, what's a better tool, a hammer or a screwdriver? And if you can answer that question, I'll answer your question because that's how cognition evolves. It evolves to solve That's why they call me next. Yeah, they, call, they call you. Call me yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, they call somebody ever for a better answer. But, uh, but, but my challenge when anybody says like, oh, intelligence is this hierarchical thing. What are you talking about? I say, well, how'd you do on your echolocation test? How'd you do? <laughs> because I didn't do so well. Um, and so the argument is that, there, that other organisms, other beings on this planet that we're so lucky to share the planet with have types of intelligence that we don't even have. And so I don't know the answer to your question uh, because I, I, I don't know. Alexandra would be better at, uh, at uh, maybe describing what that might no, be No, like. that's a perfect answer. And, and hammer. 
I would prefer a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so now so, I want the answer to your question. <laughs> is there a sense in which people before dogs became a really serious uh, path to study dogs themselves, but also other forms of cognition. Um, do you think that part of the bias against using dogs as a, a direction of scientific study was because they were tainted by us somehow? That they were somehow considered less than yeah. real, real animals who are wild? Being domesticated is yeah. a kind of like adulteration, right? And we were interested in studying wild animals, right? Like the pure animal. And something about dogs, they have been basically afflicted with us. <laughs> And the result is we've kind of changed, and we have literally changed them over many, many generations. And so it, as a model for, since as Brian was saying, human evolution, for instance, they seem less good, mm -hmm. right? But as it turns out, maybe they're even better. Yeah. As uh, Brian's, a lot of his work is about this, really, right? Yeah. I mean, what, look, can we look at the ways we're sort of mutually domesticating each other, as it were, or we are sort of also considered domesticated in mm -hmm. one way of thinking about it. So, but I do think the bias was so a little changed. bit unconsidered mm -hmm. um, at initially mm -hmm. and, and overthrown because of things like what Brian has brought to the table. Mm -hmm. So it clearly has changed. And I do want to go to the topic of evolution, which is really where it starts. The, those dogs that we see would not exist were it not for us. Is that a fair thing to say? They, they did not spontaneously evolve from wolves and we discovered them. So can you talk us back, let's, get, let's go back even further. Let's start with wolves. When did wolves appear? So, so we know um, uh, that dogs share a common ancestor with wolves. Um, we're not exactly sure, and this is uh, people looking at uh, genomic comparisons. Uh, we know it's at least 12, maybe 40,000 years ago that the two species split. Um, I think we now know, based on the latest genomic work, that living wolves are not, uh, our dogs are not direct ancestors of uh, wolf populations that are alive today. Um, but living wolves are the closest living relative, uh, wild relative of dogs. So you would not be wrong to say that dogs evolve from wolves. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so then the question becomes, well, how did it happen? Uh, and certainly humans are part of the equation, but part of uh, the work that I've been involved in is actually um, trying to point out that we may not have played exactly the role that we thought we did, because if you think about that date I just threw out to you 12 to 40,000 years ago, and you think about, huh, okay, um, what were humans doing 12 to 40,000 years ago? Well, all humans were living as hunter-gatherers. They were living as foragers. And so then you have to think about, okay, so I'm hunting and gathering, and uh, one day somebody has the great idea to domesticate wolves and leave them at home in the central uh, camp with our kids while we go forage, uh, and, and then feed them, and then over many, many generations intentionally breed them, because everybody's like, hey, you know what we should do? We should create dogs. <laughs> Like, I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm skeptical about that. Um, and so uh, I do think that the first stage of dog evolution was one driven by natural selection. It was that there were populations of, do of wolves that became attracted to humans as we became better at doing what we're still really good at, which is creating garbage and waste. Um, you know, and, the, and if you look at free-ranging dog populations now, what they basically, which is what... 70 or 80 percent of the world's dogs are. They're not our pet dogs. They're dogs living around humans in communities, but probably not owned at all. They subsist on human garbage and um, waste, frankly, right? They eat a lot of human feces. So that might have been... They eat the feces? Oh, yeah. If your dog does that, it's, it's they're what in they great do. company, yeah. I'm not sure I've ever given my dog that opportunity. <laughs> I mean, we could, we could do a scientific study right now, either on human psychology or dog behavior. I feel Raise like I'm your failing. Hand if your dog eats poop. I mean, <laughs> is anybody going to be willing to say it? Oh, just a few people are brave enough. Okay. But, They're all but, in the front for some yeah, reason. All That's the front weird. people. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know what that means. But, uh, well, it, it, one of the main predictors of whether uh, service dogs will make it through training is if they're attracted to uh, feces oh, that's a good and if thing. they are carp if they are, uh, eat eat feces. So, so yeah, one of the arguments is if you are a wolf and you are, you know 
competing directly with the super predator that humans became um, with all their different projectile weapons, et cetera, and they're wiping out all the megafauna while you're trying to be a wolf still. And you're like, you know what, guys, like this has gotten rough. Uh, and we don't know where the prey is anymore. And elk, they kick you in the face and you run, they run away and sometimes you don't catch them. And Poop doesn't run away. Poop doesn't run away. <laughs> You know where it is. It's always there. There's always more of it. Uh, and uh, nutritional analysis have been done of um, human feces, and it ends up it has protein levels of chicken, has fat levels of chicken. The new meat. The new meat. Yeah. So, so it is like a power bar for a wolf. And, and so, so the argument is there was the energetic... Uh, you know, spark for a natural selection to select on wolves that would be at a huge advantage if they were attracted to human settlements and they could go use this new energy source. And, and then we know from experiments a little bit more about how that might have worked mm -hmm. to lead to domestication. No, wolves... Oh, well, you'll get your Q&A later, brother. <laughs> so it's like 1.7 million years ago that, that wolves basically radiate. Is yes, that true? They're right. very prevalent. Yes. Uh, they're all over Europe, but they're all over. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then humans come along, and there's this kind of, you call it the carnivores guild. Yeah. And they begin to compete. Mm -hmm. And uh, the humans largely wipe out wolves. Is that fair to say? Uh, wait, as of today, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're sadly... A few hundred thousand wolves remain uh, in a few places that are pretty remote that people don't enjoy. Now, of course, there have been release programs, including in my home state of North Kakalaki. We have released wolves back into the wild, red wolves, and obviously out west that's happened. Um, and even more fun is uh, here in New York, of course, and I, 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 I shouldn't be an expert on this here in front of a whole bunch of New Yorkers, um, but uh, there has been intergression between coyotes and wolves, and um, wolves that, sorry, coyotes that came across from Canada have um, in intergressed with wolves, so there are basically hybrid coyote wolves in New York, so in some sense, wolves are back in New York as well. Amazing. And Alexandra, in your studies, I know this isn't exactly your area of evolution, but uh, do you feel that when domestication happened that it was symbiotic, or uh, did we aggressively snatch up these little animals who showed a slightly greater interest in us than most wolves? Oh, I, I think it's important to say that they probably showed no interest in us initially. That what they showed interest in was our trash, right? And they were, the, one of the theories goes, really much less fearful, basically. They didn't have that same fear of another predator that they really ought to have. Mm -hmm. And at some level over many generations, we be, either began to just um, take them in uh, because we noticed that they were early detectors of another predator in the environment or a locator of prey, or we thought they were cute, or they were also a food source for us, right? So I'm not sure that we actually so much had an attraction, I would guess, mm -hmm. for each other to begin. It's just that we began to live together, mm -hmm. closer, and bearing one another, kind of suffering each other's presence. And then it's probably quite a while before we begin to selectively breed any dogs, first for function, which is what we bred dogs for for many, many thousands of years before this very recent, extremely recent turn to breeding for appearance, which is really just since the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And so they were still wolves, but they were friendlier wolves. You, you've discussed, um, Brian, an entire theory of evolution that's based on survival of the friendliest. And, um, and I wanted to ask you, because I know you've discussed the connection with bonobos, yes. how yes. you think that that's applicable both to wolf dogs right. and to humans. Right, so the key piece of evidence to jump from survival of the fittest, which is I think what most people think of when they think of evolution, to survival of the friendliest is, um, there's a misunderstanding, fitness uh, or survival of the fittest, usually uh, many people misconstrue it, meaning, oh, the strongest, the alpha, the big, the tough, somehow they're better able to survive and therefore they even have more value, somehow they're more valuable, there's like a moral um, 
uh, weight to put on this. And so that's not at all the idea that evolutionary biologists uh, are talking about when they're talking about fitness. What they're talking about is reproductive success, organisms that leave more offspring. And if you do the big step back and you say, okay, which organisms, classes of organisms, or even specific organisms have the most reproductive success, and what are the strategies that they use to have a big jump, it is always the case that there's a big change in friendliness. There's a new type of attraction that allows for more cooperation. And those are the organisms that have some big evolutionary jump. Bonobos are uh, a case, um, but the experimental evidence for this is that there was a, a wonderful experiment done in Siberia by Dmitry Belayev, uh, where he selected a population of foxes to be attracted to people. And he compared them to a population of foxes that he did not select to be attracted to people. And they selected for many, many generations. And uh, after 20, 30 generations, he had foxes, no surprise, that would like to be near people. In fact, they loved to be held and they would they pee for joy when you hold them, unfortunately. Um, uh, I worked there, I got a chance to go see them. Um, and uh, they're very dog-like. Um, but what was interesting is just based on selection for friendliness, they now have curly tails, they have floppy ears, their uh, cranium and their teeth changed, and a lot of the differences you think of when you think of wolf dog, uh, not just in terms of their behavior, but also in terms of the way they look, uh, also changed just by selecting for friendliness. They became more juvenile. They became more juvenile, that's exactly right. And so that's the idea when you look between chimp and bonobo, our two closest great ape relatives, um, we have two closest relatives. It's like having two cousins. Um, one's a girl, one's a boy. They're equally closely related, but they're different from each other. Uh, and that's how bonobo chimp is. Uh, and so when you're trying to explain how could it be they had a common ancestor and they differ the way that they do, we think that bonobos became friendlier, particularly bonobo males. In fact, there was sexual selection where female bonobos refused to mate essentially with aggressive, mean, alpha, uh, bonobo males, uh, and then basically the balance of power shifted, and bonobo males are much friendlier now. Uh, no bonobo male has ever been observed to kill another bonobo, ever. And chimpanzees wow. have homicide rates very similar to some human populations. Um, so it's survival of the friendliest, uh, and we think the same thing happened in dog-wolf evolution. Uh, Alexandra, do you think that at the same time that dogs were being, to some extent, self-domesticated, as I believe the term that you've used. We've gone um, with that. Yeah, that human beings also fundamentally altered to kind of self-domesticate? Or do you think we are as we were had we never encountered wolf packs and dog packs? I mean, I think there's a strong argument can be made, and Brian has made this argument, that, that, we, have, that we have been changed by our affiliation with dogs. Right, that we have let someone else into this special circle that, um, and, one, and really one animal more than any other that we're gonna affiliate with and keep in our homes and now maybe in your bed, sit on us with our, on our couches, right? So that we are changed by that in a way that we haven't really changed ourselves relative to other dogs. There are mm -hmm. other animals, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've also talked about a kind of dog-human meld that is our packs. But I believe you, you refer to another term. Is it umwelt? Am I saying that correctly? The umwelt, the world. Yeah, can you explain that view. to the us a little bit? Is this idea that um, harkens back to something I said earlier about the world view of an animal or an individual. And Jakob von Uxkull was an Austrian scientist who coined this word, which really just means uh, environment in, in German, to speak to what, um, not just what an animal can sense, but what matters to the animal? And so for a dog, I would say their umwelt is very olfactorily based. What they can sense are things they can smell. But also, what matters to them is very different than what matters to us here. The dogs can detect all of these things here, but dogs, what matters to them are the people sitting in these places, right? Any dog who came up here would be interested in the smells on the floor and then would be attracted to the people. And somehow our umwelt has been changed as a species so that we also see them as mattering, right? Where we might not see other animals, the rats that New York City is trying to get rid of, we don't see them as mattering in that same way. So at some level we could say they're not in our umwelt. Mm -hmm. And we come to this point where there's some domestication. It's, we start to see dogs buried in 
graves with human beings. So the bond is swift. And, um, and then we start to breed. You're talking about breeding the foxes with the intention of making them friendlier. And I believe you said in one of your books that you suspected that they had to have bred for a certain kind of cognition, a certain kind of intelligence in terms of interpreting us. You call them anthropologists, right, Alexander? They're wonderful anthropologists. Um, and then were you surprised to find out that that was not the case necessarily, that it came along in the way that you were describing? Yeah, as an so, accident. So this is where I got my, you know, lesson in, in what science is. You know, science is not about being right or being brilliant. It's being willing to accept reality and recognizing that you were wrong and really wrong. Um, and so the idea was that I thought would be correct would be that, you, you know, if you wanted to have a smarter fox, you have to breed two very smart foxes together. Mm -hmm. And that would have been my prediction. But it ends up, when we go and measure it, and because we could go work with the balaya foxes that were bred to be friendlier, it ends up, if you want a smarter, a, social, a more socially savvy fox, actually breed two friendly foxes together, and you'll get a much more sophisticated, uh, socially sophisticated fox in terms of communicating with humans. So it ends up, the, the communicative ability we talked about that's unique and special in human development that we also find in dogs, we found the same thing in the foxes, even though they were never selected for that ability. And so it ends up, that was a big surprise, and I was really wrong. Uh, so that's what science is. So EQ is real. There is something real to the concept of emotional if, intelligence. If, if you want to have more cooperation, almost always there's a new type of friendliness that occurs first. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this idea even of breeding for dogs, we kind of, we look at them and their sweet faces and we project all of these very human experiences and emotions on them and then, to some extent, is it possible that we then breed them to live up to that projection so there's a dog say, oh, he always loves to sit on my lap. And then we breed a dog who's actually a lap dog. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that we, yeah, we project absolutely. first and then breed later. Yeah. I mean, and scientifically, I've been very interested in the projections that we make onto dogs because when I did finally start studying dogs, then turned around and looked at how my relationship with my dog changed and how everybody was already talking about what they thought their dogs knew or understood or saw perceived generally, what their desires were, the grudges they were holding, right? We had a whole rich cognitive vocabulary already to talk about dogs. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. I think that those anthropomorphisms, essentially, just attributions that come from human understanding, should be kind of interrogated and tested a little bit more, right? But, and I have done a little range of research that's about testing anthropomorphisms that we make. But I also am just fascinated in the fact that, yes, we continue to breed dogs who especially are anthropomorphically satisfying for us to look at as well, right? The reasons we have dogs with really big eyes who have this well, juvenile, infantile expression through their whole life is because we like that. We like how it looks, and we have interbred dogs who, who look more and more that way. That's how you wind up with little teacup poodles, right? And that's how you wind up with dogs with very short noses, some of these brachycephalic dogs whose noses have been flattened because it's more human-like, mm -hmm. essentially. So mm -hmm. we, we like seeing ourselves reflected in our dogs and our breeding habits um, reflect that. Now, I've heard you say, uh, I think both of you, that it's the mammal with the largest range, just in sheer size. Is that true in terms of the breeds? In what sense... Yeah, morphologically, they're incredibly different. In what sense are they the same species? What do we mean by that? Why don't we say they're actually different animals? At what point do we break that off in the same way? We say wolves are fundamentally a different species than dogs. But, you know, this German Shepherd is not a fundamentally different species than the teacup poodle. Yeah. Oh, you want to take that one? Okay. okay. I want both right. of you. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, no, that's a really uh, fun, difficult problem that in universities, there'll be two semesters spent on that problem. What is a species and uh, how do you know? How can you see it? And of course, that's what the origin of species was all about. Um, and uh, it's not by chance that Darwin started the origin of species uh, by talking about domestication because he knew that he could use people's experience with artificial selection, people intentionally making choices about who to breed together uh, to help them understand what he meant 
was happening naturally. Um, so in terms of what is a species and why aren't you know, different breeds or groups of dogs a different species, um, well, strictly, if you are able to have two individuals uh, have sexual reproduction that leads to a fertile offspring, meaning that offspring can also have offspring itself, uh, then that is one species um, by, some, by a normal definition. Um, but if you have a you know, Great Dane and a Chihuahua, and they're sitting there going like, guys, I think we're a different species. <laughs> Um, uh, so it would take some help, basically, um, uh, to, to make that happen, uh, but it could. Um, and then um, with wolves and dogs, uh, wolves do, um, uh, especially free-ranging populations, or even in some cases strays and pet dogs, do reproduce with the remaining populations of wolves, Europe, United States, etc. Um, there is introgression. Um, and so in that, if you use the ability to reproduce uh, as your definition, then it's, it becomes tricky. Mm. So you mentioned just uh, a minute ago, which I hadn't heard before about the wolves and the coyotes, but if they're reproducing, they're making uh, offspring, but are, do we know if they're fertile or infertile, the offspring that are the males so, of the wolves so, and the coyotes? So wolves tend to kill coyotes, um, but if there is a coyote who is receptive, and is at a time where she is an estrus, um, then that a wolf may reproduce with her. Um, mm -hmm. And they can have viable offspring, yes. Amazing. So um, putting the complicated kind of conversation about genetics and what we mean by um, species aside, there's also uh, these scientific attempts, which I want to get into your actual practice of trying to understand the mind of a dog. They have clearly very different biology, they have very different perceptions, we don't really know what their conscious world is like. Um, and there were, there's a history of, of behaviorism that was quite old that maybe you both could speak to that's very different than your practice which is rooted in cognition. So I'd like to ask you both about that and then also to hear a little bit about your practice. How do you get inside the mind of a dog? So Alexandra, yeah. maybe you wanna start? So all of our science really goes back to the early 20th century with John Watson and B.F. Skinner, who were behaviorists. And if you've heard of them, it's because they were renowned, right? And they really founded a lot of psychological, a psychological approach, which is you provide an animal with certain stimuli and you see what their reaction is. And behaviorists classically believed that there was no need to imagine a mind mediating the reaction to a stimulus. In other words, you can just dis fully describe their behavior and in fact predict future behaviors of an animal without having to talk about what that animal is thinking about it, if they want it, what they know. And in some ways that felt like a much simpler, cleaner explanation of animal behavior and a lot of animal training happened with that model in mind. And in the mid 20th century, psychology underwent what's called the cognitive revolution, where mind came back in to our thinking about animals. And uh, I, I owe people like Donald Griffith, who was the one who discovered the echolocation ability of bats. So you have to have a pretty fertile, open mind to be able to imagine that and experiment and discover it. He was one of the ones who started saying, listen, we have to talk about animal consciousness. We ha in order to best explain what behavior we're seeing, we have to posit that there's something in between. And every other thing we know from evolutionary uh, theory tells us that there's no reason for there to be a discontinuity between humans and other animals, where other animals don't have a mind, they're just reflexive behaviors, and we do have a mind. And so this has really taken root, it makes a whole lot of sense, we see their minds, we can image their minds, and it's part of what we're theorizing about when we look about at behavior. And I think it's what people, in, in respect to dog cognition, I think that's what people are interested in. They don't want to just know what their dog is going to do. They want to know what their dog is thinking about, right? So it's very in tone with how we live with dogs today. And you call this dognition sometimes. <laughs> yes. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think that's I, trademarked. Is that <laughs> trademarked? Yeah. Could be. Could be. Can't say yeah, that's right. You, um, <laughs> The uh, no dognition uh, um, is you know the idea that dogs have 
cognition, just like humans do. And um, you know, you were asking, how do we study dognition or cognition? Mm -hmm. And um, a big part of it is help from y'all. Um, and it's one of the things that makes our science so rich is um, I've spent a lot of time studying primates, including the wonderful bonobos that we talked about earlier. But unfortunately, they're highly endangered. And our science and our ability to answer the big questions you asked about in the beginning, um, it's incredibly limited because there's not many of them. So we're very limited in what we can ask relative to, say, dogs. There is no limit. There's so many of them. And there are people so passionate about them. And at Duke, we have a Canon Cognition Center. I know you do too. And we invite people to bring their pets in and we play games just like you would with human kids. Uh, and you try to understand um, what they can solve, problems they can solve, and then problems they can't solve, which actually is just as interesting um, and informative as the ones that they can solve. Um, so uh, in terms of method, that's how we do Dognition, is we really, it's, it's citizen science. Y'all are all deputized uh, to help us learn more, um, so then we can share it with you. So uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, so I, I'm curious about a specific example of an experiment which you feel reveals something specific to the dog mind. So I know you've talked about pointing gestures. I think even an experiment, some of the experiments that you've done around that, um, which seem pretty intuitive, but have these really strong conclusions come out of them. Can you explain well, a particular Brian is, experiment? Brian is the pointing oh, researcher. You, you're the pointing I, researcher? Yeah. <laughs> you have plenty you can. I, uh, I mean, well, one study, can or, I tell you about an olfactory study that yeah, I've absolutely. done? So one of the things that interests me a lot is trying to um, um, understand whether dogs have a sense of themselves as distinct from other dogs, right? Are they thinking about this is me, these are my plans, these are my hopes for the future, this is what I did last week, you know, have a, a, a sense of their own identity, as we do. Um, and the way this is kind of classically studied with humans is something called the mirror mark test. It's basically asking if someone recognizes themselves in the mirror and notices when something has changed about their appearance. Um, we obviously do, right? If you looked in the mirror and saw something between your teeth, you're not going to like scratch at the mirror and try to get that thing out. You recognize that it's a reflection of yourself and you can change the way your teeth look by touching your face. So dogs, when they are presented with a mirror, um, do not seem to care what they look at like in the mirror, right? And, that, and there might be a lot of reasons for this, therefore they fail the mirror mark test. And one might say, well that means they don't have a sense of themselves. So we tried to create a study which is a kind of analog of the mirror mark test, but with smell instead of with their reflected image. So we basically got a little bit of the odor of a dog, which was, which was owners, thank you owners, have collected a little bit of urine for us. And we would present them with a little urine in a canister on the floor, and then we would contrast it with a little bit of urine that had uh, an another odor added to it, a mark, if you will in their reflected olfactory image. And I w we looked at, basically we asked the dogs to approach both of them and then said, you know, which one do they spend more time investigating, sniffing? Which one are they more interested in? To see if they could distinguish them. We also presented them with other odors, like just the mark by itself, to see if that was really interesting. We also presented them with the odor of other dogs to see if they could distinguish those. Of course they can, just like they do out on your walks when they're sniffing. The, t the tree that some other dog has marked, but not the tree that they marked. Um, and we found that they do seem to spend more time and show more interest in the, their own odor if it's marked, and more interested in that than just the mark by itself. So that's my way of trying to begin to take a, basically a human cognitive test or a task that's appropriate with primates about the sense of self and make it remake it in an olfactory environment. Just to remind um, everyone, the only animals, non-human animals that have passed the mark test, uh, are they, is it a dolphin and an elephant? One elephant, Happy, mm -hmm. who's at the Bronx Zoo. Mm -hmm. uh, dolphins, mm -hmm. uh, so the chimpanzees. the dolphins will, will, will like look at themselves and then they'll like realize they're in a mirror and they'll like check themselves out. Yeah, that's a reflective. Yeah. Josh Plotnick and Diana Reese, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, Diana Reese and Lori Marino did a study where they basically used the reflective surface of the inside of the aquarium tank, the New York Aquarium, and marked dolphins in places which they could only see using that reflective surface. And they noticed that the dolphin 
you know, was really checking themselves out <laughs> to see more of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, El Happy the Elephant also examined the big X put on his head. Then there are, have been other animals now who have passed this test. I think magpies have passed the test. Um, and now there's a, a, a type of fish who, may, who argue, one could argue has passed the test, right? But most of them are animals who have, at least have pretty good vision. And in the case of elephants, they have great olfaction, but there's only one who's passed the test. So it's something that's very primate-centered and with our primate brains, we seem to think that's the only way self can be recognized, but I wonder if it could be recognized in other modalities. So you would say dogs have a sense of self? Would you both? Well, I mean, in a scientific paper, I wouldn't say that, no. Because I can't, because I haven't proven that. I mean, and so I, that's an interesting thing about somebody who lives with dogs and also studies dogs, is that we wear two hats. I talk about my dog as feeling proud when he picks up a big stick and parades around with it. But I also kind of intellectually know that I can't be sure that that is exactly the feeling, the emotion, uh, sensation that he's having. And I kind of want to question that as a scientist and say, okay, well, is there a way for me to try to test that rather than making kind of a presumptive judgment? And the reason I think that's important is not because I don't think they have rich cognitive lives, but more because I want us to be making the right attributions to them. I think that a good relationship results from that rather than making perfunctory statements about what they know or feel. Um, Brian, can you tell us about the pointing tests and, and the way in which you've concluded and other researchers have concluded that um, dogs can interpret our intentions to communicate? Sure. So um, we play a game that is played with young kids, 9 to 12 uh, months of age, and you hide, with kids it would be a toy, you hide something in one of two places, and you literally just, they, don't, they know it's hidden, they don't know where, and you just point to where it is. For a kid, a uh, young 9 to 12 month old infant, this is very easy. Um, for a chimpanzee bonobo, even grown up, um, uh, it's very difficult. Um, even if you do it repeatedly, they continue to fail. Now they can do all sorts of amazing things, but for some reason this is very difficult for a chimpanzee or bonobo, or really any other primate. Uh, that we've looked at. Uh, you do this with a dog, and it's very, very easy. Um, uh, when we started doing these games, we were having them search for food, uh, and you have good colleagues uh, like Alexandra who would say, uh, they smell the food, dude. Uh, they're not using your gesture, they just smell and go to where. <laughs> But food. I was wrong. Yeah. So, no, I mean, you know, we were too. And because we are as skeptical scientists, you think, you think that to yourself. And we, we ran a very simple control. Many of you, I'm sure, could think of it, which is if you're hiding something in one of two places and you want to know, can the dog just use their uh, nose to find it uh, on the very first choice, what would you do? You wouldn't gesture, right? You would just put your arms behind your back and then you'd make no motion at all. And you'd see if they would go directly to where the thing's hidden. And if you did that a bunch of times and it's two places, so chance is 50-50, if you do it enough, you could see if it was above chance. Um, and it ends up, they can't do it. Uh, they can find it if you let them search uh, and orbit around the area, of course, but the question is, can they go directly to the correct place? And the answer is no. So um, that was one of the, we've done a whole bunch of olfactory controls, but we've also done cognitive controls because one of the things that you could argue uh, and one of the things we do when we do experiments and trying to understand how animals think and imagining how they actually do this is we uh, really, uh, as, a, as a field or as an endeavor, we are supposed to err towards parsimony in our explanations. And so, okay, so the dog's searching where you pointed, but it doesn't mean it's doing what humans do. It could be something really simple. You just moved your arm. Maybe dogs have learned to be attracted towards moving arms. Uh, and so you can, rule that out. You can do a control where actually you close the dog's eyes, now you're pointing, they don't see any motion, and do they still use the gesture? Answer is yes. Oh, okay, well, but what about your hand? Maybe they're just attracted to hands. Well, what if you ran the experiment again, but when you point, they actually have to go away from your hand. They do really well at that too. So we can just keep running the same kinds of tests and games to rule out lots of low-level explanations, which we've done over and over again, and then we start to feel more confident uh, when we were seeing them looking a lot like kids, that really they're doing a lot what little kids are doing. So they have a pretty sophisticated social theory. Social theory not just of their minds, but of ours. 
And uh, would you say it's fair to conclude from these studies, which you mentioned already, that, that they are in some sense cognitively more similar to human children than they are to primates? And I think that's a question for both of you. So is it okay if, so, so you said they're cognitively sophisticated. So if you mean using how we normally think about intelligence as this hierarchical thing, I just then mean I say that, no. Yeah. Uh, oh, then if, I didn't mean that. But no, no, no. no I, awesome. But if you mean there are different types of cognition, and they're really sophisticated with this one type of cognition that happens to be really important in human development, called cooperative communication. Yes, they are genius in that little space. More so than wolves. Yes. Yes. With you, when it comes to interacting with humans, um, they definitely have a, a a gift for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And more so than primates. Yeah, and we could call that social cognition. That might be one way to call it. And, and one of the ways to think about it is that they're very good at solving types of problems which involve us, right? So if you want to know where the food is hidden, that's another way you could imagine. If you imagine the dog's point of view in one of Brian's experiments, and you're just like, I need to know where the food is, you could try to search for it. Eventually, if you were allowed to search for it, you could search it out with your nose. Or you could use the human's information Right? The human is giving you information. Humans do things for us, dogs have learned. I can use the humans to solve this problem. And so they're really great at using us as kind of tools to solve problems for them. And I, in fact, open the refrigerator door when my dog stands in front of the refrigerator hoping for something that's inside, right? We also interpret over time their communicative gestures. So we're reading intention in each other's behavior. Do you think they're ever like with their dog friends? Like, look, my human keeps doing this thing. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> For sure. For sure. But I do, uh, uh, riffing off that, I do want to talk about one thing that has been demonstrated that dogs really are not particularly good at. I, 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 I kind of um, alluded to uh, understanding the physical world, uh, the properties, uh, causal properties of the world, the unobservable properties that you know, allow uh, objects uh, and agents to interact. So for instance, solidity, that solid objects don't, that solid things don't pass through each other, or that gravity pulls things towards Earth, that when things are connected to each other, like, I don't know, on a leash, that they act together. <laughs> um, these are all properties of the world that dogs struggle. This is a place where they do not have a special gift. Um, and, and so um, uh, we have a game, for instance, that it's utterly embarrassing when we play with dogs. Uh, if you play with great apes, chimps, bonobos, it's a piece of cake. This is a joke for them. They're like, why are you testing me? <laughs> um, but with dogs, it is you, you have two little circle um, towels, and you put one on the ground, and it's flat on the ground, and the other you put over a bowl that has something they're searching for. And if you understand that solid objects don't pass through each other, and you're searching for whatever is hidden, you're like, oh, I don't know, the flat towel on the ground or the one that has a shape. I think you guys know, right? Maybe go to the one that it's has awfully, a shape. It's awfully quiet out there. Yeah. <laughs> the, They're yeah, flummoxed. It might no, be a trick. No, that, so you go to the, the towel with the shape, and it ends up that this is very difficult for dogs. They guess for a long time, uh, but it ends up that dogs that do worse on that problem do better in training to be service dogs. Amazing. How yeah. come? Why do you think that is, that they do better at being service dogs? They're more trusting of the human I think they're like, I have no idea. I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, by the way, a great solution for dogs in a lot of their life. If you're living with a person, they're, we control most of what happens in their life day to day, right? They're kind of captive to us. They have to wait to urinate till we take them outside. They eat when we want to eat. They play when we want to play. So yes, it's actually a pretty good adaptation to kind of let us do all the solving of the problems in this case, as opposed to being really persistent themselves. In fact, when they are really persistent, and of course there are lots of individual differences in dogs, and they do something like try to chew through the door to get out to wherever you left to, right? We're really angry at that, and we consider that misbehavior. So persistence is not encouraged in dogs, and we're not gonna probably breed that dog with another dog who chewed through the door, right? So over time, we are changing uh, dogs to more reflect the things we want, including asking us for help. 
Can, is it okay if I riff Please, on that? Yeah. Okay, so so I just wanted to say one of the other things that is remarkable to that I've observed in our research is the phenomenon you just described um, of breeding and changing dog behavior. Um, it can happen really, really fast. So I think we have this notion that evolution is this slow plotting thing. It takes millions of years and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's true. But if the selection is really, really strong, like it can be an artificial selection, it can happen super fast. So um, my example would be, we've studied canine companion dogs like Nira, who I hope some of you get to meet. Um, but we've also, as, you, uh, as we talked about, we've studied uh, detector dogs that the Marine Corps uh, use. Well, it ends up, if I showed you a picture of 100 of those dogs, you would not be able to pick out which one worked for the Marine Corps and which one was a service dog, because they're all, you would call them Labrador retrievers. But when we measured their behavior and their cognition, they were as different, those two populations were as different as two species of primate. They could not be more different psychologically. And it's because there's been intense selection on the two populations to be very different from each other, even though they're the same breed. Cognitively, they are so different if they're detector dogs from if they're gonna be service dogs. Right, right, if you're gonna be a search and rescue dog, for instance, you want to have persistence. Persistence is encouraged. They will do anything to try to find the scent that they're looking for in order to get the reward at the end of a game of of, of tug or a ball toss or something like that. So they're forever persistent. They make horrible pets in your home, but give them a task to do and they continue. So they're off the charts in that kind of problem solving. I feel so many metaphors for life right now. It's kind of alarming. <laughs> so I want to ask you about dogs' theory. They have clearly a sense of, of who we are. They have some sense of themselves, and they have a sense of each other. You, you studied a lot of dog play. Can you, uh, ex well, first of all, I know that you were, you were anecdotally studying this while you were in graduate school just because you had a dog. Yes. Um, can you tell me just sort of she about She was your... not in any of my videos, though, because okay. I was an objective scientist, so she just wanders through and out of my videos. Play is actually a great thing to study because um, in, it is in play, in, in development, our development, that we learn a lot about others. Um, we learn how things work. We learn about pretend. We learn about roles that different people play. Children play Children, to, and to understand the world. It's, and the lovely thing about dogs is that they play into adulthood, so we get to watch this behavior. And in social play, what I found is, which is just dogs, dog and dog play, what I found is that it, what looks like a very simple kind of behavior, right? We all acknowledge, oh, there's a dog playing, and that's kind of the end of it. If you look very closely, it's actually a really complex dance where they have to maintain that friendly atmosphere throughout, and they do this through multiple uh, kind of pivots with each other. And the reason they have to maintain a friendly atmosphere is because all the behaviors they're doing are aggressive behaviors in another context. So play includes biting, humping, tackling, right, chasing, uh, also lying on top of someone. And all of those behaviors, if some dog just did it to you, are aggressions, right? And a dog would respond defensively. In the context of play, they have to establish that there's play by doing a play signal, like a play bow, a play slap. There's open mouth, uh, open mouth signal, which is like a <sighs> right, that they can do to each other. And that will sort of frame a play bow and saying like, this is, let's say everything I do after this is play. Everything I do now on is play. So all of my behaviors are kind of pretend behaviors. But they also have to do it with the other dog's attention in mind. They can't just do play signals in any direction. I have to do it right at Brian, right? Otherwise he won't see it. And if he's talking to you, then I have to use a certain kind of attention getter to get his attention. If he's just chatting with you, maybe I can wander over and do my play signal in front of him. But if he's really engaged, I might have to like bite him a little bit on the back and then do, and when he turns, I'll do my play signal. So they're in, just in play, which looked just a second ago, just like, oh yeah, that's play, that looks like fun. Mm -hmm. What you see is this like high paced dance of of pretend, which involves communicating with the other dog's attention in mind. So I think it's actually a really fertile place to see how they think of other dogs' minds, just like in child play, mm -hmm. where learning about other child's minds. 
And you're talking about videos because you were filming and it was so, it was kind of quick to catch. You had to slow it down yeah. and really look like frame by frame and realize, oh, that dog's bowing every time. Or they're... Yeah, they're, so look at where their attention is going. It's like a vocabulary. And, yeah. It's yes. like a play vocabulary. Yeah, it's a way to make play this really fun thing really, really tedious if you're a researcher <laughs> is look at the play a 30th of a frame at a time. Uh, I'm conscious that people love to talk about their dogs, so they're going to want to ask questions. Um, and I want to leave an opportunity to do that, but before we wrap up, um, I'm wondering how much we really understand of what our dogs are thinking and feeling. We've talked about them understanding our gestures, being able to interpret certain things in a way that no other non-human species can. Um, you described this as a guilty look. Do we, how would we know if this dog was guilty? Or better yet, um, let me ask your professional opinion. Is this one guilty? <laughs> What do you think? Is that a guilty this is dog? Your dog? That's yes. my dog. <laughs> you know, these types of the study I did about the guilty look was just about this. The feeling we have about that dog's look is a, is just our attributing something to them. And I wanted to say, well, what really prompts that look, right? And it turns out what prompts that look is that they are responding to us again. They're not responding to some behavior that they did before, because we get more of this look if the person thinks they've done something wrong than if they haven't, mm -hmm. um, kind of tragically. But it's a very good look at communicating to us that they're concerned about that gesture you have right. and, we and they want us to take, be easy on them, go easy on in them. In this instance, with my <laughs> physics homework, Brian, I was a physics assignment I was gonna give to my class and he did not feel guilty at all. No, zero, <laughs> zero guilt. Um, I will say one fun thing. If you go back two pictures to the first guilty dog, uh, guilty looking dog, if you note uh, the white part of the dog's eyes called sclera, um, and there's beautiful work showing that uh, dogs have evolved uh, extra white tissue on the sides of their eyes, and they actually have uh, an increase in a muscle called the AU11 muscle that wolves do not have, and it allows them to pull that muscle, or sorry, that their eyelid back so that they can expose more of their white sclera. And it ends up that that is, we, people have argued that is the guilty look or the guilty eye when they use that muscle. Um, and the neat thing, you were saying, what do we know about our dogs? How good are we at reading them? And I would say, eh, not very good because one of the things that um, predicts uh, how quickly dogs are adopted out of shelters is the baseline rate that dogs pull that muscle back. So dogs that flash the guilty eye look at a high rate are much quicker to be adopted in, in two studies uh, than dogs that are less likely to flex that muscle and manipulate our feelings. And that little, and that little eyebrow muscle that which you can see marked here on Gigi. This is Julie Hex photo, my lab manager, who's out there. My former lab manager was out there. Uh, that muscle right that creates a little eyebrow expressiveness that also turns out to be you know, something we recognize in ourselves, right? No doggy Botox. No doggy <laughs> Botox. Leads to less effective communication. So um, I, before we um, wrap up, I did want to ask about a little bit about training, because a lot of people want to understand the science that you study. Uh, does that lead to being able to train our dogs better? And I've heard Brian, both of you actually, but Brian, you specifically refer to the kind of alpha wolf model of training as being kind of defunct now. Can you explain that to us a little bit? Um, well, so how I think about dog training is sort of like how you think about, I don't know, people really, is um, trying to find what is their strength. Um, if you're going to have a, a puppy and uh, you're going to train it to do whatever, I kind of want to know what its nature is what it's attracted to, what its sort of um, cognitive profile is, because it may be a dog is gonna be really good and easy to train to be a detector dog, or be a pet, or be a service dog, but it really just depends on who they are. So that's what our work has been all about, is trying to understand the individual dog, and it ends up just like some people would be great at playing the piano and other people not so much, uh, or some people good at math and some people good at 
programming computers, we all have our little individual talents that'll lead us to be good at some certain thing. I don't think it's different for dogs. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the big contribution our science can make. I also want to say, I mean, I think training is kind of mispitched. It, what we really want to do with training is teach dogs how to be, live in a human society, right? Dogs who are born to dogs, at least that's the, the latest science, are still born to dogs. They learn how to be a dog. But then when they go into our homes, they do not understand anything about it. There's nothing genetic that allows them to understand the rules of human society, what we expect of them in terms of where they're gonna relieve themselves, when they're gonna eat, how they behave with all the things we have in the house. And our job as people who's gonna live with them is, as companion, with, as, with companion dogs is to gently teach them about how to interact with all these things the way a human would. I think that's a huge struggle. And the model of training, which is you have to dominate your dog, the notion that you have to be an alpha um, to your dog is, is not only bad science, but it's just not a helpful way to teach your dog about human society. And the reason it's bad science is it comes from this idea that, um, well, actually a guy named Schenkel, who was studying captive wolf behavior in the mid 20th century, observed all these wolves who were in a small enclosure and found that they created a kind of dominance hierarchy, in fact, where some had all the access to the good resources and others kind of vied for that top dog position. And that he talked about it as an alpha hierarchy. Um, many animal communities have hierarchies, dominance hierarchies. And this was a sticky idea that got stuck onto dog behavior because once we started realizing that dogs and wolves shared a common ancestor, people thought we should look at how wolves act to understand how dogs act. And so this idea was translated to dogs that they also are in a dominance hierarchy with us and that they're trying to be the alpha and if we don't take that role, they will try to take it from us, right? Now, I mean, when have you ever seen a dog try to lead the household, right? They simply do not do that. But what turns out to be wrong about the wolf science was that this was before people could really study wolf behavior in the wild. There wasn't GPS technology, and when you, a researcher goes to study wolves in the wild, the wolves run away, right? They don't hang around to be observed. Once people could study them, they realized wolves actually live in family packs. If there's anything that's an analogy for how dogs live with us, it's that they consider us their family. And if, sure, there's sort of an alpha, those are the parents, like you with your children. Are you an alpha parent? I guess in a way you control what's gonna happen, right? But your child isn't trying to take over the household and neither is your dog. So all science really leads to a kind of just normal learning theory as being the best way to train your dog. Give them rewards for things they don't want, things you want them to do, and don't give them a reward for something that you don't want them to do. Uh, absolutely fascinating. I really want to give people a chance to ask questions. I know, I think we're a little warmer because we're under the lights, but I hope everyone isn't, isn't roasting out there. Before I open it up for questions, please join me in thanking our guests for an amazing thank conversation. Thank uh, we have a microphone over here. If you could queue up for the microphone. We don't, we only have a few minutes. I would say, uh, we'll, we'll take a handful, but there will be a book signing, so you can queue up to ask questions directly um, to our scientists and authors. Uh, is there a first question, please? And, and really questions, I, I, I'm teasing people about loving to talk about their dogs, but they really do. So this is like, questions please, thank you. Okay, so my first question, I've never thought about um, artificial selection, and that was very interesting with the foxes at the beginning that changes were being seen very quickly. So how quickly after the foxes were selected by this Russian, did the teeth change, did the tails change, rather than it, it occurring naturally, maybe? Uh, like, 20 uh, generations. And they have short lifespans, so that's how. I think they were they, bred every once a year? Yeah, they, well, they, once a year. They're reproductive once a year, yeah, so, so the generation is one year. Yeah. 
a couple and decades. How, and how long would that happen with dogs uh, with natural selection? Something, something similar. Some similar oh, if it change. was natural selection, it just depends on how strong the selective force is. Uh, in the case of the foxes, it was extremely strong. Only uh, one percent of foxes each generation were selected for reproduction. So. Um, you know, it, normally there would be two populations and maybe one population was 1% more successful than the other population. That's gonna take thousands of years for that, what seems like a small difference to accumulate. It's actually a huge difference. But in this case, it's 99% versus 1%. It's gonna go really fast. Thank you so much. Next question. Uh, so I promised my dog when I got her that I would try not to force all of my humanness on her and honor her wolf heart, and um, she has separation anxiety, and we've been working with a trainer for quite some time, uh, but we can't break through. And so I'm just curious from a scientific point of view if you have any helpful pointers in that regard. I do feel like my dog's emotional service animal. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I am his emotional service animal. Mm -hmm. Does this happen sometimes? Do you have advice for uh, humans? I mean, I, I mean well, I mean, what I would say first is that, I mean, it, it can be tragic and very upsetting, but that, that that's sort of a, that is like a range of a normal response. It makes a lot of sense that a dog who is well attached to you would feel really anxious when you're gone. And so if we start to normalize that idea, which I think helps a little bit because people get very worried that the, that the dog is showing some misbehavior, there's something wrong with the dog, right? And starting from that position, then you just have to take baby steps, which is probably what you're doing with your trainer, right? But that, and being patient and persistent, you know, having the, knowing that your dog can change over time, but that they really need to have these baby steps. You leave for a few minutes and you come back and everything's just as it was, and then the next few minutes and so forth. Coupled with also giving them good distractions. Um, maybe they like interactions with another dog. Maybe there's a friend. Maybe there's a puzzle toy that they get really engaged with or something like that. Those two things together are kind of the best science has to offer, which might not be enough. I'm sorry <laughs> about that, but um, I wish you luck. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Please, next question. Hey, um, Brian, you were kind of talking about how um, dogs have different cognitive functions with respect to like marine dogs and uh, service dogs. I was wondering if those dogs can be trained to have a different function or would that have to be selectively bred out? Uh, I think it depends on what we're talking about. Um, so um, one of the big differences we see between those two populations would be we have a task that um, there's food in a container that's really easy to get, but then we seal the container and now the problem is unsolvable. Um, and what you see with detector dogs is they are very persistent and they are going to get that thing open uh, hell or high water. Um, and service dogs tend to give up quite quickly. Um, but when they give up, they tend to turn around and look at the human and be like, you just put this thing in here. Could you get it out for me? Um, and so it, those responses are exactly what you want to see given what you're then going to be training those dogs to do. Um, in the case of a, a detector dog, you want a very persistent dog that's going to search and do it independently, not be coming back to you a lot, because actually you could negatively impact their uh, correct identification, um, and, and with service dogs, the reverse. Um, if you were to early in a dog's life give them experience, and in fact we have data now from Duke that um, just playing that game early in puppy development and even just eight times actually, you see a doubling of the uh, speed at which they turn around and make eye contact and ask for help. So it could be, and we just don't know yet, I don't have the data on detector dogs, it could be that that is one where we could uh, influence their success through early life experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have three more in line, is that right? So we'll go through these quickly, great, yes. Yeah, hopefully this is quick. Uh, regarding uh, the evolution of dogs, uh, is there, and, and with uh, relation to wolves, is there a next common ancestor that we may be familiar with that dogs descended from? Well, Darwin's original idea was that wolves uh, 
uh, sorry, that dogs evolved from uh, jackals and wolves and that there was introgression that created dogs. Um, but no, it, it ends up there's an extinct population of wolves that we know uh, dogs directly descended from and all dogs descend from that, that line. Now, subsequently, there has been introgression with the current modern coyote and dogs and there's introgression with modern wolves and dogs. Um, uh, Intergression meaning hybridization, um, but uh, no, we we know from genomic work that, uh, and and even it's even been become more refined. And one of the reasons we know that that population is extinct is because there's now ancient DNA evidence from uh, uh, fossil uh, canids that have been genotyped, and it's given more resolution. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate everyone's questions. We always have a great audience here, I have to say. Yes, please. Um, I know this is quite difficult even to understand in humans, but um, at least in my experience, I feel like my dog has a different perception of time than we do. Like, sometimes my dog reacts the same if I've been gone for five minutes as if I've been gone for eight hours. <laughs> and um, Absolutely, yeah. I don't know if there's anything, any research I'll have done around that or anything to like... There was that one study that uh, Therese Wren and her colleagues did where they actually tried to gauge um, dogs' response after people returned home after five minutes or after half an hour or after two hours. And they were looking at measures like intensity of tail wagging, um, right? Basically, enthusiasm of response. And they did see a difference between five and 10. It's just that the, they start so high. Yeah. <laughs> It's very subtle, but they're definitely noticing, marking some difference. Amazing. Um, I was just curious with service dogs, do they like develop an understanding of what they're doing directly as like a service to a person, or is it more of a food motivated thing? Oh, I certainly think that in some cases it's driven by food. Um, uh, one of the things that predicts success in these programs is um, uh, having eagerness to be rewarded, shall we say. Um, but at the same time, uh, it also relies on a, a really uh, strong motivation to cooperate and communicate with humans. Uh, and I do think that they are looking to, uh, and they, they are also rewarded just through those helpful interactions. The th types of things that Nira is trained to do uh, will be to open doors, um, to help uh, get things out of um, uh, refrigerators or move laundry out of uh, a dryer um, or take things, keys that have fallen and pick them back up. Um, and these are all things that are fun and rewarding to do for dogs together with a person because they all build on some, it, it, getting a key would be something like getting, playing fetch. Um, so these are fun things to do with a human. Um, plus you get a reward and you know, you're a part of a team and I think they like that. I think in some ways that's such a profound question because it gets at the heart of what we the, are trying to imagine the worldview of the dog. Do, and what Brian, I think, is kind of saying is like, we might view that as helping behavior. The dog might view it as something else. Somehow it still works together fabulously well. But we can't assume that their appreciation of, of what they're doing for us is the same as ours. Thank you so much for the question and beautiful answers. And it is a very profound question. The whole topic is really quite profound. I love that there's still so many unanswered questions. That's what gives us scientists a job. So thank you so much for coming. And thank, thank you so much to the audience. Thanks.